So while they're getting the, um, the slides up, I just wanted to, first of all, thank Enyan Yina for um, ending early so that I, I have some extra time, and also to congratulate uh, the Open Air Network and family for the, on the publication of these two wonderful volumes, and, and also to thank the hosts and organizers for what has been a very rich uh, two and a half days so far. Hopefully I can add to that rather than subtract. Um, so uh, my topic is here on, on, on the screens. Um, hopefully you can read it. And I'm working with some uh, concepts that I have uh, been playing around with uh, for the last, I don't know, maybe five years or so. And so I'd like to kind of present them. Um, and they're sort of in uh, cumulative so that they do build on each other. But there are nine separate ideas or concepts from my work on certification and uh, um, trademark protection um, with respect to fair trade and other sustainable goods. Um, I've looked at specifically at coffee. Um, yes, I am from Seattle and we do take our coffee seriously there. Uh, but I've also more recently worked with the question of fashion and apparel, which is really a lot of fun actually, and raises some very interesting and com complex questions with respect to certifications. And I'd like to eventually in, uh, tie it all together in the conclusion uh, by connecting it to some of the conference themes so far, including uh, the open development uh, principle for open air as well as uh, the, the scenarios. Um, and I want to emphasize that I'm really here uh, not uh, focusing so much on patents or break, so-called breakthrough innovations, but rather on uh, geographical indications on so-called traditional knowledge, what uh, um, their intersection with trademarks and certification marks, and so what Chidi might have referred to as uh, innovation by necessity or perhaps incremental innovation, which is just as important but perhaps not captured by uh, formal metrics. Um, so the first concept is brand citizenship. And um, again, as I said, this is, is a fun kind of uh, project uh, because I can sort of uh, surf the internet for clothes. Um, but what, what do I mean by brand citizenship? I want to go beyond the formal legal definitions of trademarks in this work, and I don't think I'm going to get any pushback from anyone in this room about the importance and the necessity of making sure that we understand the non-legal aspects of, of what we do, right? So the cultural, economic, political, and social consequences of trademarks is what I call brands. Uh, and so um, this example of our First Lady of the United States and her fondness for J. Crew um, exemplifies um, sort of the significance and the importance of this term, brand citizenship. That is, in the U.S. vernacular, this particular brand, J. Crew, is associated with a, a number of kind of um, nuances with respect to a presentation or self-identity, right? So it's a, a preppy brand, but it's affordable. And you can see from the, the left-hand side that you, know, you can emulate um, the First Lady's look um, with a mere $65 for a bro brooch or uh, $150 for her shirt. Um, and so what that conveys to the public is that she's, she's an accessible person, she's elegant and put together, but not beyond the reach, right? And so that, um, that's an aspect of branding that I think is, is very, very essential. That is, it's essential to our identities, but I want to, um, in later slides, actually uh, push that out to a much more capacious definition. Some people call this brand performativity. Uh, Celia Lurie in the UK has, has, has talked about this phenomenon in terms of performativity. I prefer the term citizenship to uh, capture the sort of regulatory aspects, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the second term uh, that's related to all of this is the term global value networks. Now, we tend to think of this in its more familiar incarnation as supply chains. Uh, but this goes to the question of trust and sort of what is a community in this sort of global uh, networked society that we find ourselves in um, that, that our previous speaker just asked. Um, I, I, I like the term global value networks as opposed to supply chains for a number of different reasons. Uh, I've read from different sources that there are anywhere between an average of 17 to 45 uh, different intermediary steps from the producer to the consumer in these various uh, networks. Uh, so what we're talking about are highly distributed um, networks throughout um, these global markets, right? These transnational markets. 
for example, most of the U.S. clothing um, available now is either made in China, such as the clothing I'm, I'm wearing today. I checked the label this morning. Uh, and, and actually, Bangladesh is a huge supplier of clothing for the United States. Um, and so what this, uh, hopefully you can read this, what this diagram shows you, and this is uh, the apparel network value chain, uh, value network, sorry, um, is the significance of the brand, right, as an organizing node for information or the sociality of all of this. Uh, that is, um, it, it's actually in big, bold letters here, and the consumer, which is attached to this brand, is very remote from the actual subcontractors uh, that are working to produce these clothing. Uh, so um, there, are many, there are many references to networks here at this conference, including the Open Air Network. I think the term network is very apropos in this context, particularly because each industry, whether we're talking about food or fashion or forestry, will have a different network configuration. Uh, but it's a less linear type of imagery than perhaps a supply chain might indicate, um, and I think it's more accurate. So we're talking about these value networks which are supposed to replicate the kind of trusts, trust that we have with for face-to-face -face or personal interaction with each other. And so that leads me to my next uh, slide and my next set of uh, tools in the toolkit, which is the, the, the concept of trust as it relates to trademarks. So we know that under classical, uh, classic trademark justification or rationale or theory, um, trademarks are supposed to provide a signaling function, right? They're supposed to signal the source of manufacturing origin uh, to the consumer so that the consumer can rely on that for repeated purchases. So in this case, uh, we have actually a mashup. This is uh, an example that um, uh, has been available uh, for for not only me but others to, uh, to illustrate <coughs> the practice of Shenzai, which is apparently a practice in China of putting deliberately two different trademarks, in this case the three stripes of the Adidas mark, together with the uh, swoosh, the very recognizable swoosh of Nike. Um, and so that disrupts the so-called signaling function of trademark law, but in a very deliberate way, sort of a, a mashup type of way. Um, a less understood and theorized and, and explored type of function of trademarks is the so-called trust function, which um, is illustrated by the slide on the right, where we can't actually experience directly certain qualities of goods. So for example, is the Nike sneaker made in a sweatshop factory or a factory with fair labor conditions? Is the food that we're eating organic um, or is it not? Uh, so these are what economists sometimes call credence attributes because they're attributes that we can't, the consumer is, has to trust some other person uh, to, to um, guarantee the quality of that. And um, what, I, what I call the sort of the trust function of trademarks is very, very related to this idea of certification um, within these global value networks, right? And so, uh, what we have then are these network dyads that uh, create, they focus um, and create informational value. So the brand is not only, it not only consists of the economic value, right, of the brand or the trademark. Um, for example, the top interbrand always lists the top 10 trademarks every year and, uh, you know, it's always McDonald's and Coke and lately Google has joined this, this hallowed group of the top 10. But I'm here again focusing on the non-economic or non-monetary value, that is the attentional value, the informational value, the, which is a key type of value that these brands have for consumers in, especially in a uh, digitally networked uh, context where there's so many different types of information competing for our attention, right? And so this idea of network um, also focuses on the informational value created by everyone all the stakeholders in this value network, not just the trademark owner. And so I'm focusing on three of these uh, stakeholders, but there are many more in these value networks. For example, fashion is often sourced uh, by, uh, through weavers and dyers and all sorts of other intermediaries. But for purposes of simplicity, I've kind of boiled it down to three. Consumers, producers, and the firms uh, or businesses, the brand owners. So there's a, quite a bit of scholarship on some of these uh, sort of information exchanges. There's this so-called so C2C or B2B, consumer to consumer. So we signal, like I said with uh, the first lady example, what we are, who we are, what our values are through what we wear 
to other consumers, you know, the logos that we, we like. Uh, businesses signal to each other what their market um, specificity is. So Coke is the classic, you know, not less sugary beverage compared to Pepsi in the market. Um, B2C is the firm to consumer, the classic sort of advertising type of paradigm, right? Uh, and consumer to firm. Uh, a lot of uh, intellectual property scholars have actually written about the free expression aspects of parity in trademark law, the idea that um, we, you know, I teach, a, uh, many of us teach a case involving Mutant of Omaha, which is a play or a parody of Mutual of Omaha, an insurance firm, um, or uh, Buy Cocaine, which is a play on Coke, right? Uh, these are parodies that where consumers speak, to, speak back to the uh, meanings that are provided by firms. And then um, less explored, but just as important in terms of brand citizenship, right, or participation, is the idea that producers, the people who make these things, might have an opportunity to speak to the firms, the brand owners, or directly to consumers. And that's something that I'm trying to explore quite a bit in my work. Um, so the, the next concept that sort of builds on this, and I'm very excited by this, I've termed this, uh, I've coined this term, uh, cognitive or information capitalism, and it really builds on this idea of these network social media, um, sort of the wireless engagement scenario um, of open air scenarios, uh, as um, building value, as I said before, informational attention via brands, and that there's a co-creation of this non-monetary value, okay? Now, in some ways, we, we're aware of this through the protesters, the people, for example, the students on the left-hand side who uh, rallied against sweatshop conditions and, and boycotted Nike so that the signs say, just don't do it, right? Which is a, a type of parody. Um, and um, I think the question was asked earlier in uh, this morning session, why aren't we, you know, why aren't we um, trying to uh, exercise um, um, some kinds of campaigns against the private sector, right? Multinationals, and this is an example of that type of uh, governance move by, by consumers. Um, less well known though, at least in the trademark world, is this idea of prosumers, right? That in fact, and it has a lot of uh, analogy to the idea of user-generated content in the copyright context. So prosumers is, uh, they're, they are people who are not neither producers nor consumers, they're sort of a hybrid. And marketing people and media studies, cultural studies folks have really grabbed onto this concept, but it hasn't really infiltrated into the legal literature all that much, the trademark scholar, uh, scholarly literature. But it's, I think it's incredibly powerful. So it's the idea that trademark owners or brand owners can't control the message, right? You can see that from the left-hand side, but even on the right-hand side, what they're doing now in a very deliberate way is sort of a controlled chaos. This is an example of a Nike ad campaign involving the basketball player LeBron James. I think there's a kind of a nice ironic ju juxtaposition with these slides because um, the, uh, the protesters on the left-hand side are witnesses to sort of um, unfair working conditions. On the right-hand side, Nike has kind of appropriated this sort of idea of sort of being a witness. Uh, and they created a website um, called nikewitness.com or something along those lines where consumers and fans of this basketball uh, player could basically post things, right? Post testimonials about how much they love this basketball player. And then Nike would then pick the testimonial of the week or the witness of the day and kind of highlight that particular consumer. What that means though is that consumers are providing value. Their, their labor, which is uncompensated, is creating so much of the attention, attentional value that is desired by these firms, right? And firms are harnessing and appropriating and deliberately using that to, uh, their, to their advantage. Uh, and so this is a type of cognitive or information capitalism where that surplus value, in this case, non-monetary value, is again being, essentially being used in the service of, of the multinational brands. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a way to turn that on its head. And I've used this um, case study recently of apparel now, looking good is a play on words again. Uh, it was uh, suggested to me by my friend Anupam Chander because, of course, we want to look good in the fashion sense. But I'm also implying that we need to, or we want to, we'd like to, if we had the information available to us, to look good in an ethical sense, right? That we want to, um, and 
I want, as a parenthetical, I want to say that in the United States, um, we don't have copyright protection for fashion. So this is an example of a thriving, an industry that thrives in the absence of very high IP protection. And so in terms of evidence-based policy making for IP, uh, one thing that we can say for sure is that we can, you can have a very sustainable and thriving fashion industry with, with just trademark or unfair competition protection. But on the other hand, there's a lot of weight then being placed on trademark and unfair competition law to carry some of these other values that we might want, such as fair trade or such as sustainability. And we want to make sure that when we are engaging in this sort of, um, these kinds of practices, right, that are sort of private regulatory practices or private knowledge governance practices of certification and so on, that we're not then um, making a run to the, to, to the bottom, right? Uh, a rush, rush to the bottom and the lowest common denominator. What I worry, for example, uh, in the Sincerely Africa, and it's not just my worry, I heard that being um, articulated by others, uh, in that Sincerely Africa scenario, the idea that um, these local, locally produced goods may also coincide with oppressive labor conditions, right? Uh, same thing with the informal economy. And so uh, with, with looking good, we want to signal a type of trade that's a fair trade, whether we're talking about local trade or global trade. So uh, on the left, uh, there's a picture of uh, the First Lady in a recent visit, I think it was this year, to Africa, and two African designers, and she's obviously highlighting and, and, and wearing their fashion, which is um, you know, wonderful sort of symbolic type of gesture. And also this wonderful um, website that I discovered at three in the morning this morning uh, of Fashion Week here um, in South Africa. With, uh, by the way, if anyone wants to provide that fa fabulous blue dress to me, I uh, promise I'll wear it um, to class. Um, so, but there's some really lovely clothes. So um, with all of this then, we, we need to think about then the context of knowledge governance or, uh, and the limits of it in this particular context. So we have this idea of sort of um, private certification, trying to show consumers uh, with respect to credence attributes or trust attributes that certain things are being produced, whether it's coffee or fashion or whatever, in a sustainable way, environmentally sustainable, as well as you know, labor uh, standards, to sustainable type of way. And we have auditing, the tools of auditing and certification. In fact, uh, this is sort of private ordering, right? Uh, it's sort of uh, evocative of what uh, Ruth was talking about this morning about the move from property to contract. A lot of this is contract-based and contract-driven, and they are voluntary. But these standards, these certification to standards, are key to this alternative type of trade and this alternative type of regulation. And, and one question is, are they effective? Um, are they, in fact, um, certifying to the standards that we would really want to see? So this is where even proponents of this type of regulatory approach concede that private regulation actually needs to connect with public law frameworks. And actually, Nagla mentioned sort of the three, uh, she mentioned sort of the three types of regulation, sort of hierarchy, price, and community or trust. And I would submit that actually you need a combination of all three in this context. And for consumers, um, with respect to the trust function, we need more publicly available information so that we can make considered choices, right, rather than just rely on, um, you know, sort of unreliable representations by consumers. So here's an example of something that's on the web. It's uh, put out by uh, one of the clothing manufacturers based in the United States, Patagonia. And it actually, if you click on it, I don't actually have the link here, it's not a live link, but it'll show you the sourcing of all their clothing, the location of all their factories, to the level of detail of how many employer, how many factory, factory workers are in each of these factories. And uh, Yvonne Chouinard, who is the um, CEO and founder of Patagonia, has committed himself to trying to bring more transparency to the industry, but it is a very uphill battle. Um, but I think that these are the kind of metrics that we need to kind of try to start demanding in addition to, let's say, number of patent applications, right? Is there enough, are there uh, information um, metrics with respect to the standards underlying certification marks that are being registered by patent and trademark offices in, in different countries. Uh, we need to find that out. And I know in the United States, there is, it's very lax um, oversight with respect to the standards, uh, standards uh, that are actually registered with our USPTO. So finally, 
Good. Finally, uh, just a few brief words about co-branding. So um, I've used this slide in a number of different presentations. I love it so much. Uh, and what it shows, for one thing, is that these certifiers, these uh, are basically uh, non-state actors, usually non-profits. For example, we have um, FLO on the top right, a fair, tr uh, fair Trade Labeling Organization. We've got Catholic Relief Services, Fair Trade. Um, these are these private non-state actors are are put, are actually policymakers. They're shaping fair labor standards through their certification, and that's sort of the upside or the optimistic view of this type of regulatory approach. Um, they're pushing fair trade, they're pushing other sort of sustainability or social justice kinds of values within the global trading system. And so, you know, there is a very sort of positive potential here. One of the things about this, though, that I wanted to mention is that the downside is it's very expensive for producers to comply with certification, especially with multiple certifiers. And consumers may find that this a plethora of signals is, is actually confusing, that there's too much information here and it, you, it's hard to distinguish among the various kinds of labels and marks. But um, co-branding can be, I think, a very effective way of moving a product into the consumer's consciousness. Uh, and just a couple of words, I, want, I couldn't resist, so I hope uh, you don't mind my, my little wry um, allusion to the Sincerely Africa scenario. But it made me think about local, the local food movement in Washington State in the Pacific Northwest. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this show Portlandia, but it kind of describes us in a very unique way as being very obsessed with our local food. You know, we want to know exactly where the eggs come from that are on our plate. Um, but, you know, the question of geographical indications and traditional knowledge is relevant both to developing and um, high-income countries, right? And so in Washington State, we have the Washington State Apple Commission, which was created in 1937 by the Washington State Legislature. We also have the Puget Sound Farmers Market um, Alliance, and we've had a proliferation of uh, farmers markets. The, the picture on the right is the one that I try to go to when I have time. It's about uh, a 10 minute or 15 minute walk from my house. Um, but essentially what we have are institutions, and we've been talking a lot about the need for robust institutions these are examples of institutions in my neighborhood that have been promoting and marketing uh, these GIs and TKs in the local context within uh, Washington State. In other words, bringing attentional value to the brands, contributing to brand citizenship. And one of the key Achilles heels, as people who've looked at GIs and TK know, is the marketing piece. It's very, very, it can be very costly, very expensive to engage in a marketing campaign to, to the uh, level required for consumer recognition of goods. And so to get these sort of institutions, um, the Washington State Apple Commission is, was publicly um, chartered, but it's actually a more or less a, um, an industry-driven marketing um, institution So to promote economic development in Washington State. So what are my conclusions? Well, I presented some selected insights from recent research that I've engaged in, which I've had a lot of fun doing, actually. It's been really fun to, to learn more about food and fashion. But I think that a lot of these um, concepts can be tools that are relevant to the various scenarios that were discussed in the first two days of this joint conference. Um, I think they also speak, as I said earlier, to the recognition of different kinds of innovation, including marketing innovation, including innovation by consumers around their, their conversations with each other about these kinds of products, rather than breakthrough innovations such as patents. Um, and I would also submit uh, that they, are good. they speak to the importance of str strategic engagement. So our first keynote speaker yesterday, Peter Drahls, uh, talked about strategic disengagement, which might be important in certain contexts. And that's, of course, the approach taken by Na Naomi Klein in her manifesto, No Logo, where we have to disengage with, you know, sort of the branding power of the multinational corporations. And I, what I would suggest is that, um, uh, sort of rather than no logo, uh, a, a sort of mindset of slow logo, right? The idea that we should be mindful of, the, of putting sort of qualitative intensity, values that we care about into the extensive but of course limited rationality of the conventional market economy of price. So even though um, this is my first trip to Africa, I actually connect with Africa every morning. And this is a picture of the coffee that I uh, buy uh, it's actually co-branded, so I buy it at my local Trader Joe's, 
uh, but it is, if you can read it, organic, fair trade, shade grown, and Ethiopian, because as we all know, Ethiopia has some of the best coffee in the world. <laughs> so thank you very much.